Hi guys, it's Mindy again, and we're going to kind of continue the discussion that we had yesterday, but today we're going to be in Romans. So yesterday we talked about Galatians, um, the end of chapter 2 and through chapter 3. Um, and today we're going to be in Romans. It's the same topic. Again, it's describing what the job of the Torah is, which is to convict sin. And the conviction of sin means that we can understand what sin is, so we don't do it, okay? And that Jesus provides justification, okay? The Torah cannot provide justification. Justification is having your debt paid, okay? The Torah convicts sin, but because we've had our sin convicted, we then can also have grace, okay? Because we know that we've done things that are wrong, we can ask forgiveness and move on, okay? Um, and just in a, you know, as an example, a dog may understand that it did something it doesn't, you know, that you don't want it to do, but it doesn't understand right from wrong, okay? And people, we can understand right from wrong, all right? So... The Torah just provides information about what is right and what is wrong, okay? But the Torah cannot provide forgiveness or justification, okay? So the first one we're going to read is Romans chapter 6, verse 15. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the Torah, but under grace? Never! Okay, and Paul says this multiple times throughout the New Testament, okay? It's that comparison about Tor is a good deal. You know, we shouldn't toss it out the window because we're forgiven, okay? So, let's skip on to verse 23. For the wages of, this is chapter 6, verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of Yah is eternal life through Yahusha HaMashiach, or Adonai. So I'll read that in more English for you. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through our Savior, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Okay. Now, I'm going to skip on to uh, verse 7, or chapter 7, verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the Torah sin? Never. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the Torah. For I had not known lust, except the Torah had said, you shall not covet. Okay, so the Torah said you shouldn't want things that don't belong to you. You shouldn't desire after them. I wouldn't have known that it was wrong unless someone had told me. Okay? So it's like, again, Torah is a tool. It's education. <laughs> okay. Wherefore, the Torah is holy, and that mitzvah holy and just and good. Okay, so that was verse 12. Okay, so now we're going to skip on to chapter 8, verse 6. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Okay, so we're, we're to be spiritually minded. We're supposed to use the physical to understand the spiritual condition. Okay? And Torah is the physical to learn about the spiritual, all right? But the Torah cannot pay the debt of sin. It just points out what the debt of sin is. Just points out that what, you know, what sin is and that it's wrong and that it's bad. That's all it does, okay? All right, now I'm going to go on to chapter 8, verse 19. For the earnest expectation of the creature waits for the manifestation of the sons of Yahweh. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into glorious liberty of the children of Yahweh. Okay, so creation is going to be um, redeemed through the redemption of of the sons of God. Okay? So when Adam sinned, he kind of cursed, or well, he did curse, the in, this entire level of creation. He put it all under Hasatan, the evil one. Okay? He gave, he gave over his dominion that God had given him. He not only 
gave that to Satan. But he also took the authority that was Yah's and placed it on Satan. Okay? For we know that, and this is verse 22, For we know that the whole creation groans and travails in pain together unto now. And not only they, but ourselves also, also which have the first fruits of the Spirit, or the Ruach, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man sees, why does he yet hope? Okay, so more comparison of the physical versus the spiritual. And I'm going to skip down to verse 28. We know that all things work together for the good of them that love Yahweh, to them who are called according to his purpose. Okay, so we're going to get into some deeper things about why we are who we are. Okay, and why we have different calls on us. One body, but many members. All right. And these are questions everybody's had from time immemorial. Um, you know, once we fell, people had questions. All right. So never think that you're alone out there, that your questions are weird or that you're the only person that's had these questions. Most people have these questions. Okay. All right. For whom he did foreknow. Okay. So those he knew before, he also did predetermine to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predetermine, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them also he glorified. Okay? So, we know that all things work together for the good of them that love Yahweh, to them that are called according to his purpose. Okay, so... He predetermines that there are going to be people conformed to the image of his son, that there might be the firstborn among many brethren. So we have the elect versus the multitude, okay? And that's a concept that I'm struggling through right now. I don't know why I'm fixated on it. Eventually God will enlighten me as to his purpose of why I keep circling back around to it. But that's the research I'm working on right now, the multitude versus the elect. So when it's done, I will give it to you guys. <laughs> All right. Moreover, whom he did predetermine, them he also called. Okay. And whom he called, them he also justified. And them whom he justified, them he also glorified. Okay. And I'm going to keep reading because this is pretty awesome stuff. If Yah be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for all of us, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to charge of Yahweh's elect? It is Yah that justifies. Okay, I'm going to skip down to verse 37. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of Yah, which is in Yahusha HaMashiach, our Adonai. And Yahusha means Yah's salvation, Jesus Christ, HaMashiach, the Messiah. Not a Messiah, but the Messiah. Okay? And I'm going to skip down. Um... For the children, this is verse 11, for the children not yet, or being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of Yahweh, according to election, might stand, not of works, but of him that calls. So God calls us for purpose. Okay, it was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger, as it is written, Yaakov have I loved, but Esau have I hated. So there's something else going on here. Innocent babies haven't sinned. They haven't done anything wrong. Okay. But God loved Jacob and hated Esau. Okay. So there are things going on that we don't understand, that we don't see. But God calls people for a reason. Okay. And I'm going to keep reading. I'm going to skip down um, to verse 17. 
For the scripture says unto Pharaoh, Even for this same purpose have I raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be declared through all the earth. So you remember Pharaoh? Pharaoh, who's God hardened his heart. So Pharaoh had decided what he was going to do, and he was going to shake the fist at Yah. And so Yah strengthened his heart against himself. So, okay, if you're going to be my opponent, I am going to give you strength with which to be my opponent. Not to raise Pharaoh up, okay, but that the name of Yah might be glorified in all the earth. All right? So, therefore, has he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and on whom he will he hardens. So God chooses those who he's going to be merciful to and those whose hearts he hardens against him. Okay? And I'm going to keep reading um, verse 20. Nave, oh man, who are you that reply? Okay, we're going to keep going. My dogs are barking. I hope it doesn't, it's not too distracting. So, um... I'm going to go to verse 19. You will say then unto me, Why does he yet find fault? For who has resisted his will? Nay, but, O man, who are you that reply against Yahweh? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why have you made me thus? Has not the potter, pa potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another into dishonor? So who are we to question God about what he formed us to do? One, you know, two vessels are made from the same lump of clay. One becomes a water vessel or a cooking pot, and the other becomes a chamber pot. One is used to cook food, and one is used to receive used food. Yep, one you poop in. Who is, who is, why does the pot get to have a say in what the potter makes it for? Can the cooking pot complain about the heat in the kitchen? Can the chamber pot complain about the crap in life? No. And, you know, we can rail against God and shake our fist and cry and wail and bemoan until the cows come home. But it's not going to change the purpose for which God has called us. It's not going to change the fact that God is the potter and we are the clay and he's going to make us according to his purposes and not our own. And that's a tough pill to swallow, especially for Americans, but it is what it is, okay? So, verse 23. And that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he had a four prepared unto glory. So he prepares certain vessels unto glory. Now, I am not going to play the game of who's a Calvinist and who's not. If you don't know what a Calvinist is, don't worry about it. But we are to carry the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are to put our faith where our feet are and carry the gospel of the good news of the kingdom. All right? It is not my place to determine what seeds to water and what seeds not to water. It is my job to carry the gospel, the good news of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. It's your job to carry the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, whether you are a cooking pot or whether you are a chamber pot. Okay? And I'm not saying anybody's really out there in a chamber pot, but, you know, sometimes you feel like it. And... It is what it is. Okay? I'm not saying these words. These are words that the Holy Spirit inspired Paul to write down. Okay? So, another interesting thing about Paul was his original name, Saul, was Shaul, or Sheol, the grave. And he went from the grave, living by the Torah alone... To being smacked upside the back of the head on the road to Damascus. To being Paul, the worker. Okay? He had this glorious education, so on and so forth, etc. Which he did use in his service to God. 
But he was in the grave when he was learning those things. And then when he became Paul, that name meant the worker. So he didn't come under his own name or some fancy title or what have you. He just came and said, I am the worker. His feet carried the gospel. That's it. Okay? All right. Even us, and this is verse 24, whom he has called, not of the Yahudim, the Jews only, but also of the other nations, as he says also in Husha, I will call them my people, which were not my people, and her beloved, which was not beloved. This is a beautiful verse, people. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said to them, Ye are not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living Elohim, the children of the living God. Yeshayahu, Isaiah, also cries concerning Yasharel, Israel, Though the number of the children of Yasharel be the, as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. For he will finish the work and cut it short in, the, in righteousness, because a short work will Yahweh make upon the earth. And as Yeshayahu said before, and that, that again Isaiah, except Yahweh Teshvo, the Lord God of hosts, had left us a seed, we had all been as Sodom. And, and here it's Sedom, C E D O M, so I may be pronouncing that wrong in King James English, I don't know. But been made like unto Gomorrah, so Sodom and Gomorrah. You know, if, if there hadn't been a seed, we would have all been like Sodom and Gomorrah. What shall we say then, that the other nations which followed not after righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of belief? But Yasharel, which followed after the Torah of righteousness, has not attained to the Torah of righteousness. Wherefore? Why? Because they sought it not by belief, but as it were by the works of the Torah. So what does that mean? Okay, I'm going to read the last verse real quick. But they stumbled at stumbling stones, as it is written, Behold, I lay Zion, a stumbling stone and rock of offense, and whosoever believes on him shall not be ashamed. Okay. Let me again, again read verse 32, and then we're going to have a little discussion. And, and, and Wherefore, why? Because they sought it not by belief, but as it were by works of the Torah. So what is it? Salvation. They sought it by doing works of the Torah, not by believing in God, not by believing in his salvation. But if salvation was attainable through works of the Torah, and as we discussed yesterday and today, the Torah cannot save. If any law could save you, the Torah would have been it, but the Torah can't save you. Only Jesus, who is the lamb slain since the foundations of the world, can you be saved? That's it. Jesus. Jesus is the only way to justification, salvation, forgiveness, redemption. He's it. Okay? The Torah is just to teach you the difference between right and wrong. Okay? Just like the speed limit is to tell you, okay, you can go this speed or below, this is what we will accept, and this speed or above is unacceptable. So the Torah tells us what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. Okay? It is a pattern of behavior, so when we run into things that are not specifically talked about in the Bible or in the Torah, we can assess it by the tools in the Torah to decide if it's good or bad. Okay, and God just wants us to do our best, okay? The Torah cannot save you, okay? As we discussed yesterday in Galatians, chapter, in the chapter 2, in the first half of chapter 3, the Torah is a tutor, okay? Now, when we grow up and we graduate high school, we don't walk away from our entire education and say, nope, I don't have to do any of it anymore, some of us might throw algebra out the window, but 
other than that, we don't walk away from our entire education and, you know, put the check mark in the box of education is done. Now we can go do whatever the hell we want to do. That's not how life works. Okay. The Torah is our education. It is the ruler against which we measure our actions. Okay, it can only define right and wrong. All right. Now, because we know right from wrong, we then have to recognize our sins, the bad choices we make, have made, will make, and repent of those things and turn to Jesus for salvation and justification. Okay? But if we don't learn to identify what sin is, then how can we understand what grace we have? Okay? Yesterday, we talked about if we didn't have the Torah, then we wouldn't have grace. If we didn't have law, we wouldn't understand that we were being forgiven for our wrongs. Okay? Just like a dog may understand that you wanted to do certain things and not do other things, a dog doesn't know right from wrong. Okay, it does what it's trained to do or not to do. And sometimes it understands that it didn't make you happy. But a dog doesn't know right from wrong. We know right from wrong. Okay, so when we learn right from wrong, we need to repent of those wrong decisions that we've made. Okay, that was you know, the whole difference in Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Okay? They didn't know right from wrong. All they knew was God is my master and God is training me. Okay? Eve didn't sin. She was lied to. She was deceived and she was tricked. So somebody might break into your house and toss your dog a steak so they can walk out with your TV. Your dog didn't do anything wrong. It was deceived. Okay? Your dog was deceived. That's what Satan did. He climbed over the fence and threw a stake to Eve, and she was deceived. And I know that sounds horrible. She was violated. She was very violated. Okay? But Adam understood when Eve came to him that what he did was wrong. That's why he sinned. He may not have known all the implications of what he was about to do, but he did understand that doing this thing was sin. So it doesn't really matter if you believe that Eve was seduced sexually or whether it was a real legitimate tree that had actual fruit hanging off of it and they ate of it. Okay, that really doesn't matter. And I'm sorry, my dog just knocked my curtain down. What does matter is the fact that Adam did choose to sin and he knew that he was choosing to sin. And because of that, he made us human beings in general culpable to understand the difference between right and wrong. So all the Torah can do is show us what is right and show us what is wrong. Okay, and it is a gift. Not all people through all generations were given the gift of knowing right versus wrong. Now the problem with the Hebrews was that instead of walking by faith that God would send salvation and that the Torah was just a pattern of behavior. They were trying to work the Torah for salvation, for forgiveness. And you can't do that. Your speeding ticket can't pay its own fine. Okay? Your speeding ticket cannot go to court for you and pay your fine. It doesn't make any sense. Okay? So, the Torah was just explaining the difference between right and wrong for us so that we could know and come to God and say, I repent of the wrong things I have done. I accept the free gift of salvation, your salvation, Yahusha, Yah's salvation, Jesus Christ. I accept that free gift by faith. 
and I have the hope of the resurrection. Okay? So, Abraham had faith in the coming Messiah. We have faith in the Messiah that came and that is coming again. Same Messiah, same Jesus. Okay? But... The law just tells us that we're sinners so that we can ask for forgiveness. It doesn't change what's right and wrong. Just because Jesus came, God's definition of what is sin and what is not sin does not change. And when men start deciding that they can define whatever is right and wrong themselves, it doesn't work. You get people that don't even understand which bathroom to go into. Because they have no basis for anything. They have no foundation. Okay? They're trying to build a house in a mud pit. There's no foundation. You have nothing with which on to base morals. Okay? It doesn't work. You have the Torah as your definition of right and wrong. Jesus came to pay our debt of sin that you know, the only thing we had to pay with was our life, our eternal life, the second death, at the judgment seat, and then God wouldn't get us back. We'd be gone. We'd be done. Over. Okay? But Jesus came as a man and put on the flesh and walked out the Torah perfectly, and then he laid down his life. So Jesus knew the difference between right and wrong, and he made all the right decisions, and then that perfect life he laid down on the altar to pay the price for our sins so that we could be redeemed, forgiven, justified, our bank account brought back to zero, so that we could then dedicate our life to our Father God in heaven and be brought back into fellowship with him. Okay? And we're being brought back into fellowship for service. Okay? Salvation's the ticket into the door. Okay? It's bringing the bank account up to zero. But, if you want to be useful, you know, those talents, you know, Jesus gives us talents, money, so to speak, and what are we doing with them? Okay? So that's kind of I would assume where we're probably going to end up going is what are the spiritual gifts? How do we invest those wisely? Because like I said, justification just brings the bank account up to zero. And from there, whatever Jesus give us, gives us our talents can then be reinvested into other people and the walk goes forward. Okay. Torah difference between right and wrong so that when we get forgiven we know that we can be forgiven and we know the difference between right and wrong so we can repent brings the bank account up to zero and then Jesus invests talents in us so that we can go forth and carry the gospel the good news of Jesus Christ to other, you know the gospel the good news of the kingdom of Jesus Christ to other people okay so I am going to end that here for today, guys. Again, um, the section that we read, I uh, realized we skipped around a lot, started at the end of Romans chapter 6 and went all the way through the end of chapter 9. Um, it is very, Paul can be very confusing if you are reading this for the first time without understanding what Torah is. Like I said, Torah is just, it is the definition of right and wrong. Torahlessness, lawlessness is breaking God's Torah, breaking God's law. Okay, um, try to understand what's going on in the rest of the Bible before you get to here, if you can. Um, we kind of tend to go about it backwards, sometimes from the Protestant church, but hey. So, I'm ending up there. If you have any questions, put them in the comments below, and I will try to get to them. Thank you very much. Much love and many blessings. Bye-bye.